28 a.m. you can see the last cars driving over that bridge and about 30 seconds later the ship rams into one of the bridge's supports bringing down the entire bridge. Officials say the ship was moving at eight knots roughly nine miles per hour much faster than they should have been. So tonight the major questions what happened on this cargo ship in the final moments before the collapse. The pilot at the controls is currently undergoing post-accident drug and alcohol testing. It was a local pilot specializing in navigating the port, not part of the ship's crew driving the ship. The cargo ship named Dolly was heading from Baltimore to Sri Lanka, flying a Singapore flag. This screen recording from maritime data provider Marine Traffic shows Dolly's track as it approached and collided with the key bridge. You can see Dolly veered slightly to the right at this point before hitting the bridge. The FBI saying a preliminary investigation suggests the crash was an accident and that there's no credible evidence of a terrorist attack. A short time ago, President Biden promising to rebuild. It's my intention that federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge. And I expect to, the Congress to support my effort. This is going to take some time. The people of Baltimore can count on us, though, to stick with them at every step of the way until the port is reopened and the bridge is rebuilt. We're not leaving until this job gets done. And Gio Benitez joins us now from here in Baltimore. And Gio, we understand that investigators are not giving up hope for those missing victims. Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. Right now, they are still considering this very much a search and rescue operation. But no doubt about it, everyone here is thinking about how cold those waters are under that bridge. And so no doubt about it, those, those families must be heartbroken right now, just waiting for that word. Meanwhile, the mayor here has announced a prayer vigil. Lindsay. The dark, uh, cold, and, and long hours. Gio Benitez, our thanks to you. As this investigation into how this catastrophe could happen is well underway, we are learning new details tonight about the ship and its history and about the construction of that bridge 47 years ago. Our Terry Moran is on the scene with that part of the story. This is the moment that the 95,000 ton cargo ship, the Dolly, was getting perilously close to Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge. You can see the power flicker on and off seconds before disaster. Now the urgent investigation into how the crash occurred and if the crew could have done anything more to avoid it. ABC News has obtained records showing the Dolly, built in 2015, had at least two documented issues in the past. A June 2023 inspection found a deficiency for propulsion and auxiliary machinery concerning gauges, thermometers, etc. And in 2016, after the ship was involved in a previous crash in Belgium, inspectors issued a deficiency for structural conditions concerning hull damage impairing seaworthiness. This image, taken in Belgium, shows the moment in 2016 that the ship hit a wall. As for the Baltimore Bridge, that 1.6-mile-long span opened in 1977. Experts say it was likely not designed to withstand a crash like the one that occurred overnight. Once the pier is hit, it just falls vertically down, you know, which would give every indication that either the boat knocked the bridge off of its supports, so it lost the support that way, or literally destroyed um, the, that first concrete pier and, and, it, and it lost um, the support altogether. In this satellite photo, you can see the protective piers on the power lines running parallel to the bridge, clearly visible. But Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg at a press conference on the scene was skeptical piers would have made any difference. I do not know of a bridge that has been constructed to withstand a direct impact from a vessel of this size. 850,000 cars and trucks flowed into the port of Baltimore last year, making it the nation's busiest for U.S. auto imports. Tonight, facing the possibility of a prolonged shutdown, the big three automakers are diverting shipments to other ports as needed. Terry Moran joins us now. Terry, so many questions investigators are trying to answer tonight, but I would imagine that chief among them is why that vessel lost power to begin with. Absolutely. That's what maritime experts have been telling us. The key question, why did the ship suddenly lose power? And they say that fire on board, that computer system malfunctions, even bad fuel are all possible explanations to look at. They also say that investigators will be carefully scrutinizing those videos that show the moments of catastrophic collapse. Lindsay? Terry Moran out here from the wee hours. Terry, thanks so much for your reporting.
Governor Wes Moore says the focus remains on the search and rescue mission, and he's met with the families of those missing. He says the road to recover will be a long one. I had a chance to speak with him just a little while ago. Governor, thank you so much for your time again on, on such a hectic day, a tragic day. Uh, and you, know, you were just telling me that you'd been talking with some of the, the families of, of those who still remain missing and, and give us a sense of, of their reaction to all this today. You know, their, um, their strength is just extraordinary. Mm. Um, and they're, they're faithful people. They're prayerful people, and I uh, I prayed with them. Uh, I prayed for them, and uh, you know they sent their family ones and their loved ones off to work with the full expectation that they were going to come home. You know, when a person's in a in a work zone and working on a bridge, you don't find that to be a hazardous mm. occupation, and it shouldn't be. So the fact that we have these families that are now uh, that are now hoping and praying. Uh, for, for a result of bringing their family members home, it's, it's, it makes this heartbreak that much more heartbreaking. Uh, for those who are not in this area and don't really kind of have a sense of, of the lifeline that this bridge provides, just kind of put that in perspective for us. Uh, th this, this represents so much of the economic vitality of, of not just the area uh, and not even just the city, but of the state. I mean, this, this area is responsible for about over $191 million of economic activity a day. Uh, it's responsible for about 8,000 jobs. And so to look at a skyline that doesn't even look familiar, uh, that key bridge has been there ever since I've been born. And so uh, this is surreal, looking up and, and, and not seeing it there anymore. Uh, but it, it has significant economic impacts, and that's why our commitment to rebuild it, our commitment to work in partnership with the federal government and our local partners to make it stronger than ever, it is, uh, that is my resolve, and we are going to make it happen. Your immediate reaction when you heard? Uh, I remember when uh, my phone rang, uh, probably a little after 2 in the morning, and uh, my chief of staff, he said to me, he said, the key bridge is gone. Mm. I said, what do you mean, gone? He said, it collapsed. Um, it, it took my breath away because that's all, that's all we know. Mm -hmm. That's all we remember. That skyline with the key bridge, uh, knowing that over 35,000 people uh, travel over that bridge every single day. So um, it, it literally took my breath away when I, when I heard those words uttered. What kind of uh, assurances, support can you offer to the community that's now worried, I guess, on a smaller level about the traffic, but, but also now concerned just about the safety, the stability of, of other structures? Yeah, I, I would say to, to everybody in, our, in, our, in this community and everybody within our state uh, that, that their safety has been and will continue to be the number one priority for me and this administration. Uh, not only will there be a full investigation into what happened here, uh, what led up to it, the aftermath and everything like that, uh, uh, we are going to make sure that we are going to build back even stronger. Uh, you know, I think we have seen even just in the past, uh, in, in these past hours, that, um, that we, are, we are Maryland tough and we are Baltimore strong. And they should know and will know that in our administration, we're committed to making sure that we're building back strong. Will there be plans to inspect other local bridges, other structures in the area? Yeah, I mean, well, one thing that's going to happen is we are going to be able to take a look at our infrastructure as a whole. That, that had actually been a priority that we had even before this. And, and I know this situation and the full investigation has still got to happen. But when you have a vessel of that size moving at that speed and you have an inability to steer the vessel, uh, there's not many structures uh, that could take on that kind of power and pressure. Uh, and it, but yet at the same time, this does become an important opportunity for us to look at infrastructure as a whole uh, throughout our state. And, and one more point before I let you go. Let's talk about the heroics, the, the heroics of, of the police officers who were able to, to prevent countless deaths. You know, when, when, that, when that mayday came across, you had officers who immediately jumped into action and started keeping cars off of the bridge. Uh, we're talking seconds. That saved countless lives. Because when you think about the consistent traffic, even at late, even at late times of night, the consistent traffic that, tra that traverses over that bridge, had you had multiple cars that were on that bridge and backed up when the collapse happened, you know, it, this would have been something that was already a catastrophic incident that would have been even more catastrophic. So uh, those are heroes in our midst. Governor, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much.
And now let's bring in Elizabeth Scholze, who joins us from Washington. Elizabeth, the port of Baltimore, as we said, is the ninth largest port in the U.S., the second busiest in the mid-Atlantic. Give us a sense of the extent of just how disruptive this could be to the supply chain. And Lindsay, you heard it there in your interview with the governor. There is an economic impact to the city of Baltimore and possibly on a, on a scale nationally as we look to the longer term effect of this disruption. And a lot of what this will depend on when it comes to the supply chain is how long this stalling of any ships in and out of the port is in place. It was going to take some time to get the ship out. You know, as you can see there, it is surrounded by steel. It's going to take time to actually move the ship out. Until that happens, nothing else can go in and out. And so that means that any commerce that would typically go through this port, the ninth bu busiest in the country, the first busiest when it comes to importing cars, 850,000 cars come into the port every year, that's just not going to happen. $80 billion in commerce goes through this port every year. Just to put that into context, Lindsay, that translates to about uh, 120 to about $200 million every day. So what that means is that's revenue that's not coming through the port. There are 15,000 workers who rely on that job on the port indirectly or directly for work. So this puts them in a state of uncertainty as we wait to see how long it's going to take, not just to clear the ship then, but of course to rebuild the bridge and get that longer term construction underway too. And so any nearby alternatives while this port is shut down? And thankfully, right now, there are. We've been talking to a lot of companies and economists who say they have learned their lesson from what we went through during the pandemic when it comes to the supply chain. And this is along the East Coast, where there are a lot of other ports as options. Companies are already starting to divert some of their operations there. All right, Elizabeth Schulze, super informative. Our thanks to you. Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott has also been squarely focused on the search efforts, but he also acknowledges the ripple effect that this will have on the city's economy. I spoke with him earlier today. And the mayor of Baltimore, kind enough to join us now. Brandon Scott, we thank you so much for coming on the show on what is, I know, uh, been such a hectic and, and tragic day. Uh, just give us the status as far as the latest that you know right now. Well, this is, this is still, a, obviously, this is a tragic and horrific incident uh, here in our city. Uh, this is still an active search and rescue. Uh, the most important thing, and I want everyone to hear me and hear me very clearly, right now, the thing that we are most concerned with are the lives, the six people that we're searching for in that water are behind us. And that's what is the most important. We're talking about families uh, that are hoping and hanging on the hope that their loved one will, will come back home. And that's where I focus. As far as you, you know, we believe that those at least six people at this point are, are construction workers or yes, maybe? Yes, we believe they are, are construction workers who were just simply uh, trying to improve uh, transit infrastructure for their fellow Marylanders. Uh, and unfortunately, we're in this at the place uh, when uh, the bridge collapsed. It sounds like things could have been a lot worse had it not been for the heroic actions yes. of, of the police officers. Yes, and those folks are true heroes. Uh, after the Mayday call went out, uh, police officers were able to shut down uh, ongoing traffic in both directions, saving countless amounts of lives. And we have to thank them and truly understand how heroic and brave their actions were. And give us a sense of that Mayday call. Do we know what time it came in and how much of a distance it was from before it crashed? We, we don't We don't have all the specifics just yet, but there wasn't uh, that much time uh, between the Mayday call and the, and the accident, which makes those efforts even more heroic. And give us a sense, just for those who have, of us who don't live in this area, just what a lifeline this bridge is. Well, 30, over 30,000 uh, cars go over this bridge every day. Uh, but it's not just about the bridge. Uh, this port is the ninth largest in the country. It is the largest for car import and export in the country. And uh, we have to understand uh, the impact that that's going to have on uh, the workers who work on the port, the supply chain, and all of those things. But right now, that is secondary uh, to the search operation that is going on right now, the folks that we are trying to save lives. Yeah, tell us about the one rescue that were, you were able to make early this morning. Well, there was there was two. One refused help and, and one uh, one gentleman was taken to a hospital. Uh, and we're, we're very hopeful that he'll be able to fully recover. But we know uh, that is because of the great work of our first responders. Our fire department from Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County has been here. We had Prince George's County, our dive teams from all of those agencies, including our police agents, 
agencies. Uh, we have the U.S. Coast Guard. We have the state. Everybody is working here together. As you just heard from the governor, from Secretary Buttigieg, from President Biden, from myself, from our senators. Everyone is here together uh, because this is how we operate in Maryland and in Baltimore. We operate as one because what this is about for us is making sure that our community knows that we will come back stronger and better than ever. But right now, we are all focusing in love with those families. And, and what message would you like to send to your residents who might be concerned, one, that this was terrorist, and two, they were concerned about their transportation? Yeah, listen, this we have no indications. We've been working with our partners in the FBI and our federal law enforcement partners from, from the jump, and we have no indications of that, of, of this being an act of terrorism. We know that there will be uh, traffic disruptions, obviously. Uh, this bridge uh, was actually built to support traffic because of our, our 95 tunnel of having a lot of traffic in the morning times. We're going to have to understand that there are going to be detours. This is going to be a long road. But uh, when we think about uh, the realities of what those families are going through versus us having to spend a little bit more, bit more time in traffic, uh, we can't even compare. Uh, we will build back. We will come back stronger. Baltimore always recovers when every time when we're counted out, uh, we always come back. But today, we have to continue to wrap our arms around those families and throughout this process because this is a tragic and horrific incident. Mayor Brandon Scott, once again, just thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And now let's bring in Dr. Norma Jean Matei, former president of the American Society of Civil Engineers and a member of the Biden administration's National Infrastructure Advisory Council. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, many on social media, as you may know, are sharing opinions on possible preventative measures. Uh, from your viewpoint as an engineer, could anything have been done to lessen the damage from this kind of impact? So, so this bridge, um, as was mentioned, has been in service for quite a while, about um, over 40 years, put in, put in service 1977. In 1991, um, AASHTO, which is the entity that puts together bridge design specifications, published a manual, a specification on um, vessel collision for highway bridges. So this, this bridge actually predates that specification. But when you look at the specification, it talks about navigation channel characteristics. It really is trying to get into the probability of one collapse and a probability that the, the ship pier would be hit. And that in, includes if a vessel goes off course, human error, poor weather conditions, or loss of power or, or the, the ability to, to move or, or steer. Uh, and that seems to be the case here. But in my opinion, that's a very large vessel going pretty fast for a vessel of that size and um, a direct hit on a, a pier, a major pier that's holding up a three-span continuous steel truss bridge. Um, I don't think even if those spe those new spe newer special specifications had been um, used in the design of this bridge, that we would see a, a bridge stand up to that type of force. And so the infrastructure bill has opened the door for more bridges to be constructed. Are bridges that have been built more recently based on those new specifications that you mentioned, are they better capable of sustaining major impact like this? So maybe a, not a head-on collision of a, of a vessel at that velocity and of that size. Um, because you're, you're looking at risk. And so... What is the probability that a bridge pier there would be hit head on? More than likely, the risk would include a off, a little bit off angle, and you could use some, some a variety of different techniques to either um, absorb the energy or deflect the vessel. Or in the case of this rebuild, they may want to go with a longer bridge span that gets uh, the, the bridge, the major bridge piers further away from the navigation channel. Or in the case of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge that went down in 1980 due to a freighter hitting its pier um, because of bad weather, 
they simply replaced that that bridge uh, with a bridge that the, that pier was founded on an island. And so the island then caught, would cause a vessel to run aground before it would reach the pier. In the case of Baltimore Harbor, I don't think you have the room. The room. Really uh, helpful information that you have there. Dr. Norma Jean Matei, we thank you so much for joining us. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime tonight. New developments a day after heavily armed federal agents raided the L.A. and Miami homes of music mogul Sean Diddy Combs. ABC News has confirmed he is the subject of a federal sex trafficking investigation. What did his attorney say just a short time ago? Actually, we are going to we are going to actually join a, a Coast Guard press conference already in process. And after that, we'll be able to take a few questions, uh, but we do need to keep it brief because we want to get these folks back to work. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Rear Admiral Shannon Gilry. Hey, good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to say thank you to all of the first responders that have come out today to assist in looking for these individuals. We've had tremendous support across the state and county and city and federal enterprise. You've seen for yourself the helicopters flying over, the small boats that are out there, the Coast Guard cutter that's out there, the boats that go back and forth bringing people out on scene to search for these individuals. So thank you to those, this entire community for helping in that regard. Second, I want to say thank you to the community for the outpouring of support to those first responders and in particularly the outpouring of support and prayers and support for the families of the six individuals. So I would like to announce tonight that based on the length of time that we've gone in this search, the extensive search efforts that we've put into it, the water temperature that at this point we do not believe that we're going to find any of these individuals still alive. And so this evening at about uh, 730, we are going to suspend the active search and rescue efforts. Coast Guard's not going away. None of our partners are going away, but we're just going to transition to a different phase. And so I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Butler, please. Good evening and thank you all for being here to echo the Admiral's comments here. We really appreciate the support from the community to all the first responders here. We appreciate your patience and allowing us to do the best job possible and get the information as it comes up. At this point, as the Admiral said, we're going away from the search and rescue portion to a recovery operation. The changing conditions out there have made it dangerous for the first responders, the divers in the water. We will still have surface ships out overnight at 0600 hours tomorrow. We're hoping to put divers in the water and begin a more detailed search to do our very best to recover those six missing people. Thank you. With that, we have time for just a few questions. We know there's a lot of questions uh, that still have to be answered, and uh, we do have time for just a few. So uh, if we could take a few, please. So do we think it's, it's still just six that there's talk of maybe other cars on the bridge? All, yes, all the information we have is individuals. six individuals. Got it. Yes, sir. Can, can you go into detail uh, about how difficult this might be for the recovery uh, phase of this now? Like, what kind of challenges are you up against? Well, I'll start by saying I'm going to turn it over to the experts on diving. I'm not an expert on diving, but we've got very difficult water temperatures. You have structures from the bridge that are in the water that can move with the tides and currents, making that dangerous for divers and people in the water to actually try to do recovery. And we do not want to injure any of these first responders in this recovery effort. We, we absolutely want to be as safe as possible for everyone involved in this. And I'll, I'll let, let's see Colonel Brown has anything he wants to add. Can you go into specifics about what the search and rescue entailed? Like were there scuba divers or was everything above water, sonar, any sort of equipment that might have been utilized over the past 12 months? From the outset, we moved all those resources in with dive teams from various state, local, and uh, county agencies. We also use sonar. We're doing our very best in some very difficult times and difficult conditions, which is why we're making that transition now. The last thing we want to do is put divers in the water with changing currents, low temperatures, very poor visibility, visibility, and so much 
metal and other unknown objects in the water. All it takes is one object to strike an individual and all of a sudden we have a first responder trying to recover another first responder. I think at 0600 we'll find ourselves in a better position to understand the dynamics of what we're dealing with and to address the issue in a much safer manner. Did the authorities have six IDs now and have those victims each been contacted, those families I should say? I can't speak on that. That's still in the investigative portion of this. All of that is unknown at this point, and as I said, we have to cease operations. We can't start again until we can assure the safety of those divers and the rescue personnel that are going to participate in this. If we look at how, how challenging it is at a simple motor vehicle crash to extract an individual, I'm sure we can all imagine how much harder it is to do it in climate weather when it's cold, under the water, with very limited to no visibility. That is correct. So, Colonel, you're confident then that no other vehicles made it onto that bridge before the collapse or as it was collapsing, I should say? Based upon the fact the original information that was provided, the Maryland Transportation Authority Police Department was able to shut down traffic. Is there the possibility that there was another vehicle on there? other than those vehicles involved in the construction process, I think we all would have to understand, yes, that's a distinct possibility. As unfortunate as it may be, it's a distinct possibility. However, we don't have any information to support that at this point. When you bring the divers out, do you have an idea of where the individuals are, if they were in cars or not, and do you know how long this recovery effort is going to take? We do not know at this point. I'm sure as you've seen some of the aerial photos, there is a tremendous amount of debris in the water from containers hanging off ships. We have to make sure those are shored up. We're going to work with structural engineers to help them understand how to navigate and address the challenges of having bridge structure in the water that may be sharp, that could puncture a suit, that could puncture an airline. All of these are things that we must take our time with. You know right. This last question, by the way. I'm sorry? At this point, we do not know where they are, but we intend to give it our best effort to help these families find closure. How might inclement weather tomorrow impact the recovery efforts? Very clearly it could, but we're going to do everything in our power to help these families find closure. How stable has the boat been? Yes, how do we get their names, title, spelling? Have Folks, we're going to be we're going to be establishing Unified Command as well as a Joint Information Center. And I know there's a lot of questions, um, and we're going to be providing that information where we will uh, continue to provide updates. Uh, but that is that is the extent of our updates tonight. We thank you all for coming. Thank you. And so we have just heard the Coast Guard give an update on the Baltimore Bridge collapse here. They are suspending the active search and rescue at this point. The operation is moving into a recovery mode. And Jay O'Brien joins us now. Uh, Jay, you have a, a number of extenuating factors here. It's dark, it's cold, and the duration of time. We're now uh, in excess of 15 hours since uh, the bridge collapsed just over my shoulder. And so we, we had to know that at some point uh, they were going to have to call it. And certainly this is not uh, the news of the, the families of those six people still missing wanted to hear. Yeah, and Lindsay, I've been checking in with folks I know uh, who, who work in search and rescue, and, and they felt that this announcement was impending for quite some time. It's been more than 18 hours, as you said, of those six people in the water. Uh, where I'm standing here, I'm in a different vantage point of the bridge than you, but you can get a sense of the kinds of conditions that they were talking about that make this search and rescue effort, in their words, so dangerous. The temperature of the water on average today has been about 48 degrees. Uh, 
hypothermia can set in in those conditions in just about an hour. You see night is falling around me. This bridge collapsed at 1.30 a.m. this morning, and so there was a period of those search and rescue efforts that were conducted in darkness in the aftermath of the collapse, and now we are entering into another period of darkness. And you heard those rescue officials there say how dangerous it is for first responders to operate in those conditions. Changing tides, as you noted, chilly temperatures in the water, and the sheer amount of debris that is right now on the ocean floor. It's tough to see from my vantage point, but the entire middle section of the bridge Uh, we just lost our connection uh, with Jay O'Brien. We'll be right back. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Now to the other major news tonight, 40 miles south of where we are right now, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments today in the first major test on abortion since overturning Roe v. Wade almost two years ago. The case brought by a group of doctors opposed to abortion is challenging the FDA's authority to ease restrictions on a drug used in more than a half of all abortions. Here's Rachel Scott from the Supreme Court. Tonight, hundreds of protesters descending on the Supreme Court as the justices hear arguments in the most consequential abortion case since Roe versus Wade was overturned. The court considering whether to roll back access to the abortion pill mifepristone, used in more than half of abortions in the U.S. A group of doctors opposed to abortion rights, arguing that if a woman taking the pill needs emergency care, it would put a doctor who opposes abortion in a terrible position. These are life-threatening situations uh, in which uh, the choice for a doctor um, is either to scrub out and try to find someone else or to treat the woman. But the Justice Department argued that doctors who brought the lawsuit have no grounds to sue. FDA is not requiring them to do or refrain from doing anything. They aren't required to treat women who take mifepristone. FDA is not directing the women who take the drug to go seek out care from these specific doctors. And today, a majority of the justices seem deeply skeptical of the effort to further restrict the drug. I'm worried that there is a significant mismatch uh, in this case between the claimed injury and um, the remedy that's being sought. What they're asking for here is that in order to um, prevent them from possibly ever having to do these kinds of procedures, everyone else should be prevented from getting access to this, this medication. Even conservative justices like Neil Gorsuch, nominated by Donald Trump, also sounding uneasy with limiting access to the pill. And this case seems like a, a prime example of turning what could be a small lawsuit into a nationwide legislative assembly on an FDA rule or any other federal government action. The only two justices who seemed inclined to side with the anti-abortion doctors and further restrict access to Mifepristone, Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. Hey, Rachel Scott joins us now from the Supreme Court. Rachel, how has the FDA made access to Mifepristone easier over the years? And ultimately, what's the timeline here for the court's decision? Yeah. Over the last several years, the FDA has actually rolled back some of the restrictions, like you said, making it easier to access the abortion pill mifepristone, which is used in more than half of the abortions in the United States. So you can now uh, get access to the abortion pill by mail. You no longer need those three in-person doctor appointments. You can also use the pill up and through... Uh, 
10 weeks of pregnancy as opposed to just seven weeks in pregnancy. The Supreme Court is expected to issue a final decision in June, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott from the Supreme Court for us. Thanks so much. Former federal prosecutor and ABC legal contributor Khan Nowaday joins us now. And even some of the conservative justices, Khan, appeared skeptical of this case brought by a group of anti-abortion doctors. The FDA's attorneys argued today that the doctors had no standing. But I'm curious that if they had no standing, then how were they successful in getting this case so far all the way up to the Supreme Court? Well, I, I think the success is ultimately because the Supreme Court wanted to hear it and granted cert on it. And and I think the reason for that is they just wanted to kick it on the issue I think that everyone seems to agree on based on oral arguments. They're going to kick it on standing. At least the majority of the justices we heard from oral argument were very skeptical that these particular plaintiffs suffered any concrete harm that these particular plaintiffs have standing to bring this legal claim. It was a conservative-leaning federal district court in Texas that first issued the ruling to limit access to Mifepristone, saying its safety and efficacy had not been sufficiently studied. A conservative appeals court then basically upheld that. Are you surprised to see conservative Supreme Court justices potentially disagreeing with those previous rulings? I, I'm not that surprised because I, I think this follows in some ways the, the principle that's driving the justices, the, the conservative justices on this court, which is they're trying in some ways to stay out of certain uh, touchy subjects that they think uh, really the legislature should decide or the, the FDA should decide. So I'm not too surprised um, g given the, the nature of the, the matter that they were dealing with. All right, former federal prosecutor Khan Nowaday, thank you so much as always. And joining us now is Alexis McGill Johnson, president and CEO of Planned Parenthood, a national organization that provides sexual and reproductive health services. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I'm sure that you've been closely watching the Supreme Court case. Uh, for those who have used Mifepristone or could in the future, is there a reason to worry given what you've heard in court today? Uh, well, Mifepristone is still safe and still effective and still legal, and I think it is very important for patients who, you know, have uh, appointments uh, to, in the next uh, week, in the next day, to understand that the medication that they may be seeking for abortion care is still legal until or if this court rules otherwise. What I heard in the courtroom today uh, was a lot of skepticism about the standing. Uh, what I heard was a lot of skepticism about the role of courts and politicians challenging the medical expertise of the FDA and the real you know, base, the foundation of 5 million patients who have safely and effectively uh, you know, used uh, mifepristone to terminate pregnancies um, without uh, uh, without uh, much uh, repercussion, and so I think that both on the on the standing, and I think some very important, legitimate um, kind of pressure tests on the actual um, expertise, medical expertise that the FDA brings, uh, not the court system, um, was really important and a, and a very big part of the conversation in the courtroom. Planned Parenthood has 600 health centers across the country, as you know, that treats more than 2 million patients each year. How would these women be affected if Mifepristone was banned or restricted? Well, post-op, 70% of patients uh, at Planned Parenthood health centers are choosing to use uh, mifepristone uh, to terminate their pregnancies. So it would be uh, not just uh, an impact to, obviously, the, the states where abortion has been severely restricted um, under six weeks or so, uh, but even in states where abortion uh, remains legal. Uh, any restriction on uh, access to uh, to mifepristone, whether that is changing the way in which the telemedicine laws work or requiring in-clinic visits, those sorts of things will add different kinds of burdens to, to patients. And so, you know, we're talking about an impact in New York and California and Illinois. And I think that's why, you know, the justices made um, such a, a important point around the remedy being so much more outsized than the hypothetical, very hypothetical harm that the, uh, that the uh, Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine um, doctors were claiming um, because this this remedy would in fact 
uh, if they were to succeed, impact uh, the entire uh, country, including those states that allow mifepristone um, to be uh, prescribed and, and, and used in, in states where abortion remains legal? And medication abortions in the U.S. were rare just 20 years ago, but today they are used in 63 percent of abortions. Just how important would you say that this pill is for that procedure? I think it's very important. Uh, obviously, as I said, many uh, many patients are, are choosing uh, mifepristone. Um, it is it does allow a level of uh, a measure of of freedom, uh, a measure of privacy and control over one's destiny and one's future. And I think it is you know I think we get into very tricky questions when you have courts and politicians challenging the FDA. I think that's one of the reasons why you saw uh, the pharmaceutical industry aligning with the FDA. They're not normally um, on the same side of, of the fence on many other um, many other interests. And I think it was very interesting that they uh, joined with amicus briefs uh, to uh, to support the FDA because they understand that when you have courts, when you have politicians without medical expertise trying to second guess the uh, the expertise of, of the actual scientists who've been conducting studies uh, over um, over decades, uh, that that becomes a slippery soap. It impacts innovation. It impacts uh, really any drug um, that someone could object to, like a vaccine um, that I think could really endanger the health of the population. So very big questions uh, in the court today, not just related to uh, abortion, but certainly the fact that abortion um, and mifepristone remain uh, safe uh, today um, is certainly that's giving a lot of my um, you know, my colleagues at Planned Parenthood and the patients that they serve um, a lot of um, a measure of, of, of hope and security there. Alexis McGill Johnson, president and CEO of Planned Parenthood, we thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. And now for a different perspective on this Supreme Court case over the access to abortion medication, Mifepristone, I want to bring in Kristen Wagner, the president, CEO, and general counsel for Alliance Defending Freedom, an organization, a Christian legal organization that represents anti-abortion groups like the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine, uh, the group that was behind today's case. Uh, Kristen, we just heard the head of Planned Parenthood talk about how a ban on this medication would jeopardize women's health across the country. Uh, your response to that? The FDA said to the court today that no one has the right to be able to challenge the FDA's action. And the FDA betrayed women and girls when it removed common sense, longstanding safety protections for women, including just simply having an in-person doctor visit. And then it told doctors and hospitals to handle the fallout. The FDA's own label says that one in 25 women are gonna have to visit the emergency room just because they took this drug. And up to 7%, according to the FDA's own statistics, say that they'll have to have surgical intervention as a result. I think that we want to remember that this is the same FDA that approved opioids for chronic pain and told us that there would be a low risk of addiction. When anti-abortion groups wanted to challenge the FDA's approval of this drug, they chose not to challenge it in Maryland, which is where we are right now and where the FDA is also headquartered. Instead, they challenged it, as you know, in Amarillo, Texas, which didn't even have an abortion clinic. How do you respond to critics who say that, that you were simply judge shopping for your best way to challenge this at the Supreme Court? That's not at all true. We represent thousands of doctors who are in this litigation and a number of associations who are based in different places throughout the United States. And one of our lead doctors who actually has had to treat women, including unconscious women who have come into the ER as a result of severe complications, who lives right near where this lawsuit was filed. I think that it's important for the American public to understand that even as recently as 2020, the FDA said in writing in a formal statement that ensuring in-person visits by doctors when these drugs are taken was not only minimally burdensome to the patient, to the woman, but also necessary to ensure that these women don't suffer severe complications. Well, those examples that you just cite are really contrary to when uh, press today, Erin Morrow Hawley, the law professor who argued against the pill, she was not able to identify a single physician who had directly experienced a conscious violation because of these rule changes. You were there in the courtroom. Do you have anyone who's actually been injured uh, by this pill's approval? 
Oh, absolutely. Our doctors who have filed declarations in this case have said, and it's confirmed by the FDA's data, that when an in-person doctor visit was removed, actually they've seen an increased number of women who have presented with severe complications. And our doctors in this case have had to help those women in those situations. In addition to that, the FDA itself recently has said, and even in the data most recently in 2021 says, that emergency room visits have, will increase as a result of their decision to not only remove the in-person visits before a woman is induced into labor in the in her dorm room or in her home, but in addition to that, 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 that thousands of women have suffered severe complications because of taking this drug. I am curious to get your reaction to uh, Supreme Court Justice Gorsuch, who, as you know, is, is known to be a conservative on the court, uh, who suggested that this was a small case that, that shouldn't have been brought to a national level. I don't think that's what Justice Gorsuch suggested today. He did express concern about the scope of a nationwide injunction as opposed to ensuring that the remedy in the lower court was tailored to the plaintiffs that filed the case. In this particular instance, though, the associations that were represented here represent thousands of doctors across this country. I think something else that's very telling about what happened today was the admission by the drugs manufacturer who said their primary motivation in taking the stand that they did was simply to increase their profits. It's to sell more drugs. We, again, need to understand that in this case, the, the evidence is not even contested. The FDA's own statements say that, for example, since the in-person visit has been removed, that patients will be expected. In a study, it went up 12.5% that women would have to experience unplanned medical interventions as a direct result of the FDA's uh, involvement. And in fact, 300%, there's been an increase of 300% of hospitalizations since these common sense safeguards were removed. We're simply talking about one I'm ensuring bring that it up. I just patients wanna, I just wanna, it, I just want to go because you, you seem to think that I mischaracterized uh, Gorsuch's comments, and I want to quote. He said that this is just a quote, a handful of individuals, and that even if they were injured due to the pill, the remedy being sought here, a nationwide restriction of the pill, is disproportionate and broad. Your yes, he's, he's referring he's referring to the relief that was provided at the lower court and the breadth of that relief and having that relief be tailored. And, and that's what he's talking about is the remedy of the injunction. But in terms of what's actually happening in the case, the remedy is something that the court considers at the back end. The FDA's position has been that they can't even be questioned on the data that they cite in their own labels. Right now, if a woman goes out and buys mifepristone and um, takes this drug, what they will find out is that the label itself warns them of severe complications and that one in 25 women are going to have to visit the ER as a result. And ironically in this, one of the restrictions that was removed by the FDA was an obligation of physicians and others to report serious adverse consequences. That's shocking that the FDA would support that kind of a removal in terms of just a basic safety standard. Kristen Wagner, President, CEO, and the General Counsel for Alliance Defending Freedom, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I want to go back now to the big story here, the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge here in Baltimore. We've just learned from officials the search and rescue operation has now become a recovery operation. Well, I'd like to announce tonight that based on the length of time that we've gone in the search, the extensive search efforts that we've put into it, the water temperature, that at this point we do not believe that we're going to find any of these individuals still alive. And so this evening at around uh, 7.30, we are going to suspend the active search and rescue efforts. So that was just moments ago. But what we do know is that around 1.30 this morning, the container ship called the Dolly slammed into a support beam of the Francis Scott Key Bridge that spans the Chesapeake Bay. At the time, eight construction workers were on the bridge. Just two of the workers survived. Local and federal officials and the Baltimore community are now all bracing for a long recovery ahead. And we are joined now once again by Jay O'Brien uh, for more. Jay, what's the latest you've heard on the investigation into the collapse? 
Well, uh, uh, Lindsay, we know the NTSB is running the investigation. So much of the attention, as you'd imagine, in that probe is on to that ship, the Dolly. The Dolly's crew is being praised for doing the right thing when that ship apparently lost power and was headed on a collision course for one of the piers of the bridge. The crew issued a mayday call, and that allowed law enforcement time to prevent cars from crossing the ship. And that construction crew, it appears, were the only people remaining on the bridge, rather, when it collapsed. But there are questions as to what caused that power outage or that apparent power outage on the dolly. And I've also talked to shipping experts who say, did the dolly have power redundancies that may or may not have failed to prevent a kind of catastrophic loss of power? Because controlling a ship like that, steering it away from an obstacle without power, I've been told, is next to impossible. And President Biden said today that the federal government would pick up the tab for rebuilding this bridge with Congress's support. Should we expect any obstacles to this in Congress? Well, oftentimes there's gridlock on Capitol Hill about anything, even things of this nature that have such bipartisan unity behind them. Uh, but there is one thing in President Biden's corner here, uh, Ben Cardin, the senior senator of Maryland, who has said he's not going to run for re-election, but has said that he's throwing his full weight, which is a hefty political weight. He is very, very well respected on Capitol Hill behind efforts to make sure Maryland has what it needs for the long run. The president has pledged, to your point, that the federal government will reimburse the state of Maryland, the city of Baltimore, for every dollar it takes to rebuild the key bridge. But the question becomes, does that hit any kind of partisan roadblock in Congress? Certainly, this is going to be a month's, if not a year's long effort. We have already heard from state and federal officials who are saying they're getting ready for the long haul as they go out of that first phase of this response, which is search and rescue, and now on to the recovery phase, and then the ultimate third phase, which is going to be cleaning up and eventually rebuilding. All right, Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you. And finally tonight, from here in Baltimore, where we are thinking about those eight construction workers who were on the Francis Scott Key Bridge early this morning, six of them who are now presumed to be dead. They were hard at work, literally embodying the expression to build bridges when catastrophe struck. For 47 years, this bridge stood as a symbol of what can be accomplished when people work together. And that spirit is what this grieving community will no doubt need on the long road ahead to recovery and ultimately one day build bridges once again. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Chicago. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane. Celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. And that's sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? 
The Housewife and The Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. You should see me. Strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in the crowd. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are coming to you live from Baltimore tonight, where a bridge that took years to construct came crashing down in simply a matter of seconds. As shocking as the images are of the collapse, the shockwaves extend far beyond what transpired this morning. The bridge, a critical crossing for 12 million drivers, a vital lifeline as the ninth busiest port in the country. And then there's the emotional collapse, shattering the psyche of this community and now the grief. Tonight, officials have just announced the search and rescue operation that went on all day has moved to a recovery mission. Around 1.30 this morning, the container ship called the Dolly slammed into a support beam of the Francis Scott Key Bridge that spans the Chesapeake Bay. At the time, eight construction workers were on the bridge. We know two of the workers survived, but sadly, the other six are now presumed dead. We are learning about the heroic police officers whose fast thinking to close the bridge to traffic saved countless lives. And then there are the mounting questions tonight about why the massive container ship, which is about as long as the Eiffel Tower is tall, suddenly veered into the support beam. What caused the power issues on board and who was warned and when? Our team is standing by tonight to try to begin answering some of those questions. Our transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez, leads us off with the latest on the investigation. Tonight, the image is shocking and devastating. A massive, nearly 1,000-foot cargo container ship losing power and ramming into Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge. Yo! The 1.6 miles long bridge crashing down in just seconds, plunging into the Patapsco River overnight. The Key Bridge, the Francis Scott Key Bridge just got hit by a cargo ship. Baltimore's mayor declaring a state of emergency. The Coast Guard, the NTSB, and the FBI all on the scene. The intense urgent search and rescue efforts underway. Sonar detecting vehicles underwater. First responders, fire departments, and Coast Guard teams all rushing to the scene in the immediate aftermath. Searching through the overnight hours in the freezing water. Eight construction workers were on the bridge according to the construction worker. Construction worker Jesus Campos says he knows some of the team working on that bridge. Eso, eso los pegó muy duro. That was really hard, Jesus says. We are colleagues from work and friends. We pray for the construction workers who are on the key bridge, and we pray for everyone who has been touched by this tragedy. Tonight, we're learning moments before the crash, the ship issued an urgent May Day, allowing quick thinking police to block traffic on the bridge. Hold on, traffic on the key bridge. Uh, there's a ship approaching that just lost their steering. The officers then planning to get the construction crew off that bridge before it collapsed. The whole bridge just fell down. Start, start, whoever, everybody, the whole bridge just collapsed. The quick work of law enforcement who kept more vehicles from coming onto the bridge, they undoubtedly saved uh, innumerable amount of lives. It all happened just before 1.30 this morning. You can see cars crossing over the bridge just moments before impact. Video timestamps on this live stream footage showing the ship's lights went off at 1.24 a.m. before turning back on a minute later.
Then thick black smoke begins pouring out of the top of the ship. 1.26 a.m., the power turning off again and then back on at 1.27. At 1.28 a.m., you can see the last cars driving over that bridge. And about 30 seconds later, the ship rams into one of the bridge's supports, bringing down the entire bridge. Officials say the ship was moving at eight knots, roughly nine miles per hour, much faster than they should have been. So tonight, the major questions, what happened on this cargo ship in the final moments before the collapse? The pilot at the controls is currently undergoing post-accident drug and alcohol testing. It was a local pilot specializing in navigating the port, not part of the ship's crew driving the ship. The cargo ship named Dolly was heading from Baltimore to Sri Lanka, flying a Singapore flag. This screen recording from maritime data provider Marine Traffic shows Dolly's track as it approached and collided with the key bridge. You can see Dolly veered slightly to the right at this point before hitting the bridge. The FBI saying a preliminary investigation suggests the crash was an accident and that there's no credible evidence of a terrorist attack. A short time ago, President Biden promising to rebuild. It's my intention that federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge. And I expect to, the Congress to support my effort. This is going to take some time. The people of Baltimore can count on us, though, to stick with them at every step of the way until the port is reopened and the bridge is rebuilt. We're not leaving until this job gets done. The president offering his assurances there are thanks to Gio Benitez for that report. As the investigation into how this catastrophe could happen is well underway, we're also learning new details tonight about the ship and its history and the construction of that bridge. Our Terry Moran is on the scene with that aspect of the story. This is the moment that the 95,000-ton cargo ship, the Dolly, was getting perilously close to Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge. You can see the power flicker on and off seconds before disaster. Now the urgent investigation into how the crash occurred and if the crew could have done anything more to avoid it. ABC News has obtained records showing the Dolly, built in 2015, had at least two documented issues in the past. A June 2023 inspection found a deficiency for propulsion and auxiliary machinery concerning gauges, thermometers, etc. And in 2016, after the ship was involved in a previous crash in Belgium, inspectors issued a deficiency for structural conditions concerning hull damage impairing seaworthiness. This image, taken in Belgium, shows the moment in 2016 that the ship hit a wall. As for the Baltimore Bridge, that 1.6-mile-long span opened in 1977. Experts say it was likely not designed to withstand a crash like the one that occurred overnight. Once the pier is hit, it just falls vertically down, you know, which would give every indication that either the boat knocked the bridge off of its supports, so it lost the support that way, or literally destroyed um, the, that first concrete pier and, and, and it lost um, the support altogether. In this satellite photo, you can see the protective piers on the power lines running parallel to the bridge, clearly visible. But Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg at a press conference on the scene was skeptical piers would have made any difference. I do not know of a bridge that has been constructed to withstand a direct impact from a vessel of this size. 850,000 cars and trucks flowed into the port of Baltimore last year, making it the nation's busiest for U.S. auto imports. Tonight, facing the possibility of a prolonged shutdown, the big three automakers are diverting shipments to other ports as needed. Our thanks to Terry Moran for that. And joining us now is Jay O'Brien. And Jay, what's the latest you've heard on the investigation into this collapse? Well, as Terry noted, it's the sheer force of the ship, experts have told me, hitting one of those piers that was just uh, irredeemable. It was always going to cause a collapse, I've heard from civil engineers. So that's why the investigatory efforts, I've been told, are focusing on uh, the dolly and that ship and how it lost power and why it lost power, as Terry detailed. We know the NTSB is conducting that investigation, and that is going to be one of the key focuses. The other focus, obviously, as we've heard officials say, earlier in the night, as you noted, is that this is now transitioned from being an active search and rescue to a recovery effort for those six who are still missing and now presumed dead, Lindsay. And today, as you know, uh, today the president said that the federal government would pick up the tab for rebuilding this bridge with Congress's support. Uh, should we expect any obstacles to this in Congress? 
It's interesting because we've seen natural disaster funding or any kind of funding of a tragedy like this in the, in the aftermath face some kind of hurdles before wildfires in California and things of that nature. So there's always that possibility that the president isn't able to get Congress to help him make good on that promise of refunding the building effort of the new bridge uh, by every dollar. But he does have a key ally, as you and I have been talking about over the course of the night, who's Ben Cardin, the senior senator of Maryland, who is stepping down and not running for re-election, but a serious force on Capitol Hill who committed at the press conference today that while this is going to be a long effort, the federal government, he says, is going to be there every step of the way as the president committed as well. And you've spoken to a few civil engineers about what happened. What have they said about how this happened and why? It's interesting because the piers, and it's tough to see it over my shoulder because night has fallen. It's one of the reasons why they said they've suspended, at least for the evening, a search and rescue now recovery efforts. But the, 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 the bridge had two piers right in the center of it. And the dolly struck one head on. And one of the things that the civil engineers and other bridge experts have told me is that while those piers may be able to withstand a brush from a ship or kind of a glancing blow, and even that with a ship of the dolly size might be an open question, a direct hit, as you heard the transportation secretary say in Terry's package, is what made this, in their view, so catastrophic and immediately, A, took out that first pier and took out that second pier and caused the middle section of the bridge to just immediately collapse right there into the water. All right, Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you for your reporting today. As the area faces that prolonged shutdown, many are wondering what's next. I got a chance to speak with Senator Ben Cardin earlier today about just that. And now kind enough to be joined by Senator Ben Cardin. Thank you so much for your time. Sure. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I know that you've been under, you, I understand that you've been able to talk with the, the president and also the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. What kind of assurances were they able to give you? Well, the president was very clear that he wants to make sure that the federal government's there every step of the way, do everything that's necessary to deal with this tragedy. That means helping us in getting the channel reopened, helping us in replacing the bridge, helping us with the damage to our economy. Uh, of course, our first mission is search and rescue in regards to those that are missing. So uh, the president was very clear about that. Secretary Buttigieg has been clear about it. You have federal partners here from the Coast Guard, from the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Small Business Administration, all here to help us. And what kind of assurances would you in turn give to those uh, residents who are, are really concerned, not uh, just about the, the traffic, but also just the, the, the chaos that, that has been created here? Well, the impact on our economy will affect everyone. It's supply chain challenges of getting product to the market. It's direct employment that's going to be very much impacted. People not getting paychecks and not being able to participate in our local economy the way they did before. Indirect jobs are going to be lost. It's going to have a major impact for, uh, for a significant amount of time. We can't get this done overnight. The channel is blocked. We've got to make sure it's stable before we can remove uh, the debris. Uh, so it's going, to, it's going to take some time. And, and when we talk about time, and obviously it's just a few hours old, and the, the priority, as it's been stated multiple times, is the rescue effort. But is this a, a year's, even if this is a fast track, this is a, a year, multiple year long endeavor? It's going to take time. We don't know how long. The rescue missions will be completed pretty quickly. We expect that. Uh, we then go in to assess what we can do to remove the debris. And it's not stable, so we have to make sure no one gets hurt in removing the debris. That will take some time. We're not going to get that done overnight. It's going to take some time. And you need heavy equipment. Fortunately, we have some heavy equipment in the region. So it, it, it'll take a, a, a bit of time to be able to assess what we can do to clear the channel, which is our first priority. Then replacing a, a bridge is going to take some time. Uh, uh, I know that we can streamline it, cut through some red tape, but it's still going to take some time. Your immediate reaction this morning when you, when you heard about this? I, I was just shocked. I, I, I knew it was going to be major impact on all of us, but when, I, when you start to, to look at the, the indirect impact of, of this tragedy, how many people are going to be affected by it? Of course, we think of the, the victims and their families first, but so many people are going to be impacted. The supply chain is going to be disrupted. Getting product to market is going to be more difficult. And of course, those who are not going to have a paycheck because the port of Baltimore is closed. How vital is this bridge? Oh, it's, it's critically important to the uh, north-south traffic. It's one of the major uh, uh, bridges connecting the 
uh, I-95 north-south. Uh, it's very important to the Port of Baltimore from the point of view of commerce. It is a commuter uh, bridge for people who work on one side of the bridge or the other and live in the other. Uh, it is a major thoroughfare for traffic, uh, interstate as well as commuter. All right. Senator, once again, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you joining us. Good to see you. And still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, protests broke out while the Supreme Court was hearing oral arguments in a case that could severely restrict the sale of a popular abortion drug used in more than half the abortions in the United States. And the tough questions posed to attorneys representing doctors opposed to abortion. And the United States is attempting to win the extradition of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, hoping to put him on trial for publishing classified intelligence documents, what a British court decided today. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Their reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a carry in it. How important it made to USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. Ismael. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from the nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarine, the USS Kentucky in South Korea, I'm Martha Raddatz. You're streaming ABC News Live. And we're going to go now live to Governor Wes Moore, who is giving an updated press conference at this hour. We've had a chance to reach back out yet because um, it's been a pretty overwhelming day. We just want to let them know how much we appreciate it. Uh, you know, and the thing that we know is that for all the people who are offering support, this is going to be a long journey. Um, you know, that, that the people for, for people who are offering support, we know that tonight uh, is challenging and difficult. We know that tomorrow is going to be challenging and difficult. That next week is going to be challenging and difficult. The next months are going to be challenging and difficult. So the thing that I would say to everybody who wants to find ways to support, uh, stick with us. Because we know that this is going to be a long journey. That Maryland, we're going we're gonna to get it right. And we're going to win, and we're committed to it. And we're committed to doing it in partnership with everybody who's reached out to offer support. 
Governor, this is the second time in a year that we've lost this many of these, you know, immigrant highway workers. What's your reaction to that? Well, it's, it's, it's part of the reason that I'm so thankful for the lieutenant governor and the work that she's done around work zone safety. You know, when, when we saw this massive need for the state to be able to move aggressively on this issue, to say that, you know, there's certain occupations where we understand that there's, there's dangers associated to it. You know, our, our law enforcement officers, et cetera. For someone filling potholes, you don't think that's a, one of those professions. And so part of the reason that I'm so grateful for the leadership of our lieutenant governor and even the legislative package that she has authored and, and pulled together in this legislative session is it's something that we have to take seriously. Uh, and it's something that we have to have a greater sense of uh, just a more aggressive approach to it, to making sure that people who are in work zones feel a sense and a measurement of safety, but also that people who are outside are respecting those who are working in those zones as well. And I don't know if there's anything you want to add as well to that. Yeah, sure. So, as the governor mentioned, you know, one of our value statements is to leave no one behind. And that means every worker in the state of Maryland. And many of them are ones that put themselves in harm's way every single day as part of their job, including the, uh, the folks that we just lost recently uh, on this incident, as well as an incident that happened over a year ago on 695. So we're going to do everything we can to strengthen our laws. Uh, increase enforcement, um, you know, make sure we get the education out there to let drivers know to be careful as they drive, not to speed. Uh, and in this case, we're going to have to make sure our maritime um, safety is also part of that. Thank Governor, you. At the Baltimore Sun, we spoke to the construction company Brawner Builders, no. and they told us of seven employees, six that were missing and one that were recovered. So there's a discrepancy, discrepancy there between what the company said and what <laughs> The transportation authority said with eight individuals. So can you offer any insight there? Was there a third party inspector, maybe a state inspector on there? Yeah, any insight into that difference? Yeah, no, the um the, the number that we have and the number we're working with is uh it's the uh the, the eight people total. Okay. Uh and that includes the two people who were uh um who one who's in shock trauma and the other one who's uh recovering with without injuries. Okay, but no no insight into whether they were all from one company or one was a state inspector, perhaps? Or no, I, I think that, that's, that's information that we're still sorting through. Okay, thank you. Governor, what legislative or executive tools might you have at your disposal to accelerate the recovery and rebuild the process? Well, I think uh, these are conversations that we're going to have with, um, with, our, with the General Assembly. Uh, same thing with the conversations that we're having with the Biden administration right now. Uh, we know that this is going to have to be all hands on deck. Um, when we're talking about the long-term recovery and for what it's going to mean, not just for elements of the key bridge, but all the other elements that this has impacted. Uh, you know, we're talking about a bridge and we're talking about a, a, a harbor that's, you know, responsible for over $191 million of economic activity daily, uh, something that's responsible for 8,000 employees. And so we know that there's not one angle, one facet, or one, uh, or one part of our society that, um, that we're going to be leaning on to be able to address this. So it will include conversations with the General Assembly, but it also will include conversations with our federal partners as well. Governor, have you been able to reach out to the families and talk to them um, following this incident? Uh, yes, we have. Um, we've had a chance to spend time earlier today with the, uh, with the families, and um, they're remarkable. They're, uh, they're prayerful people. And we had the chance to pray with them. We had a chance to pray for them. And, um, and we want to let them know that, uh, that we are going to keep on praying for them. And not just us, but they have got 6.3 million people. And they've got a whole country and a whole world who's, uh, who's praying for their peace. Anything that they shared about their family members that you think it's important for people to know? You know, some people saying, obviously, they're hardworking people. Anything else that they shared with you that you think it's important? To... I think they, um, they wanted people to remember that they were family members. They were fathers and brothers. They were cousins. They were, uh, they were sons. And, um, and to get a chance to spend time with the family members who were remembering them uh, not, not just ex not exclusively as, as hard workers who are working on something that's very important to our long-term success and our long-term pride as a city and a state, but, um, but these are grieving family members who are grieving their family members. When will you be back out, Governor? 
Uh, we're, this is uh, so we'll, we'll be we'll be back out tomorrow. Um, yes, and 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 we are we are going to make sure that uh, again this is going to be a long term journey for our state to recover. But if there's something that I know that has been on full display today, uh, we are Maryland tough, and we are Baltimore strong, and we are going to make sure that as a state we are going to get through this together. We are committed to getting through it together, and we will be in uh, we will be in consistent and constant communication with the people of the state uh, to make sure that, that everybody understands our collective role in uh, in doing right. Governor, we heard from some experts oh, earlier today right talking about the support to the bridge, and maybe there should have been something. Some bridges have something to deflect in a hit like this. Yeah. Is that something you want to look at statewide as the result of this? You know, talk a bit about your thinking of looking at other bridges and maybe trying to you know find ways to protect them from you know, situations like this. Yes, it, it's something we're going to explore. Uh, you know, we're 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 going to do a complete and full analysis of of not just what happened in this scenario in this situation, and this is a relatively, uh, you know, this is uh, an unprecedented situation, right? Where you have a ship and a, of of a cargo mass that large moving at that speed, it's difficult to understand what infrastructure could have taken that level of that level of hit and that level of direct hit. So we do understand the uniqueness of this situation and part of the heartache of this is the uniqueness of this situation. But we also do think that this warrants a time for us to really think about our infrastructure as a whole. Uh, our, our maritime infrastructure, rail infrastructure, all infrastructure, and making sure that Maryland uh, can lead the way in having real core infrastructure assets that are, uh, that are both safe and effective. And I know we had a couple folks just joined, so if y'all want to ask one more question. I, I'm so sorry. I'm so late to this. We were on the complete wrong side. Can you kind of give me a reaction to the now update news of the six people who are, they're like kind of any recovery tonight or switching to recovery now in the search and rescue? Uh, it's, um, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a really heartbreaking, um, conclusion to a challenging day. Uh, we, we put every single asset possible, uh, air, land, and sea assets to bring, um, to add to the members' survivability for these families. Um, while even though we're moving on now to a, uh, to a, a recovery mission, we're still fully committed to making sure that we are going to use every single asset to now bring a sense of closure to the families. Hey, hey thank you, everybody. The community that they, one of these workers was uh, uh, recovered and identified, is this something you can confirm? Yes, I want to say that one of the workers was found and identified as something you can confirm? Yes, there's a, one, one, of the, one of the workers uh, is in shock trauma. And, uh, and there you have it, the words from Governor Wes Morris saying it was a heartbreaking outcome to a challenging day. And finally tonight from here in Baltimore, where we are thinking about those eight construction workers who were on the Francis Scott Key Bridge early this morning, six of them who are now presumed dead. They were hard at work literally embodying the expression to build bridges when catastrophe struck. For 47 years, this bridge stood as a symbol of what can be accomplished when people work together. And that spirit is what this grieving community will no doubt need on the long road ahead to recovery and ultimately one day build bridges once again. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here with you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. For now, streaming live from Baltimore, Maryland, I'm Lindsay Davis. Have a good night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming.
wherever you get your podcasts. Start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. You have another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane, celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2, only on Hulu. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. This is Sir Combat Operations Center. We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a pair, you know. How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. I'm Zoreen Shah reporting from the New Hampshire primary. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is Nightline. What do you like to do when you're out of school? Oh, um, get on my phone. On TikTok. TikTok. Ashley is everything you think a typical seventh grader would be. <laughs> but not everything is as it seems. At just 13 years old, Ashley became a mom to a little baby boy nicknamed Peanut. They've asked us not to show their faces or use their real names. Tell me about what the last year has been like for you. Mm, kind of good. <laughs> But not that good, though. Perhaps the understatement of the year, if you ask her mother, who found out her daughter was pregnant by rape. When the nurse came in, the police came in. I'm like, what the hell is going on? What is going on? As a mom, when you listen to your daughter describe at 12 years old that she was raped, did you think that there would be an option for you in this state? Yes. A rape should be like, you automatically, you can have an abortion. You see this timid little girl. I mean, she's literally a little girl. And she was like a deer in the headlights. She had no idea what was going on. This young family story now center stage in the raging debate after the overturning of Roe versus Wade. <laughs> Mississippi has banned abortion, but does allow it in cases of rape. So by all the rules, Ashley should have qualified for one. But here she is with an eight-month-old baby. Why? As states keep passing new abortion restrictions, rape victims are caught in a web of conflicting laws and confusion, left asking the question, what do I do? And often finding no answers. So what did you think when you realized that your baby is going to have to deliver this baby. She was scared. She was sad. She didn't want to go through it. That was probably one of those days that will just stick in my head forever. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. It's sad. I think about a woman, a girl, with no rights of her own, basically. She can't make a decision about her own body. Since the fall of Roe, the number of rape-related pregnancies in states with restrictions is in the tens of thousands. It's become a national flashpoint. And in some states, with no or minimal exceptions for rape, politicians left defending those laws. Texas will work tirelessly to make sure that we eliminate all rapists from the streets of Texas. God is perfect. 
God does not make mistakes, and for some reason he allows that to happen. I think it could be fair to say that there is a lot of confusion and misinformation about abortion across the country. Regina never imagined in her wildest dreams that she would be a grandmother at just 33 years old. It's been a really tough last year for you and your family. Oh, yes. It's very tough. Like, I ain't cried as much as I did last year. Do you struggle to make ends meet? Yes. It's hard. Very hard, especially people with kids. Regina has three kids, all girls. She holds down a job during the day and attends nursing school. Life was hard, but doable. One of the poorest counties and the poorest state in the country. That was until late 2022, when her middle daughter, who we will call Ashley, started withdrawing. She quit the cheer team and stopped going outside. Then Ashley started getting sick, really sick. She ended up throwing up. She was throwing up a lot. We took her to the hospital. They took her to the back. The nurse was like, you're pregnant. And that's when I just broke down and started crying. Baby, she's 12. She don't know nothing about no, having no babies. Nothing. There wasn't even enough time for the shock to wear off before the next bomb hit. Ashley said she had been raped by a stranger in her own yard. Put his hands over her face, over her mouth, and took her to the side of the house, to the back, and stuck his stuff inside her. Then I was like, that's rape. She didn't know him. She, she didn't know his name, nothing. To hear what she's describing at 12 years old. I was hurt, baby. My heart broke. I was on call at the hospital. Dr. Erica Balthrop is a board certified OBGYN, one of only seven in the Mississippi Delta region. I performed the ultrasound. And the two of them watching it together, and mom, tears are just streaming down her face. 11 weeks. Mm -hmm. 11 weeks. And I asked about options. What's the options? Abortions. She said the closest one is in Chicago. I said, Chicago? That's like $800, $1,500 to have an abortion up there. Then I'm like, I got to drive, I got to leave work. I can't afford that. Since the fall of Rome, all the states surrounding Mississippi instituted similar bans and restrictions, some without rape exceptions at all. Abortion access basically disappeared across the whole region. None in Tennessee, none next door in Arkansas, none next door in Alabama, none. So the only option for a woman that can afford to travel is to travel hundreds of miles away. Take off work, find a sitter, do what they have to do. While Mississippi law does include that exception for rape, those cases must be documented with law enforcement. Ashley's rape was reported to police, but with so much confusion about the laws, Regina didn't know they could use that to ask for help. And even finding a doctor to do an abortion would be a challenge. She was failed by the system because she had a rape that she actually reported. Physicians have so much at stake in terms of losing their medical license, financial penalties, and in some cases, criminalization leading to jail time. If you meet the exception and you can afford to still get an abortion in this state, where do you go? You can go to any OB office if they are willing if they are willing. The provider has to be willing. Most people wouldn't do it here in the state. They would refer you out. Do you believe that these laws are designed to make it nearly impossible, even for a victim of rape, to have access to an abortion? It's a loaded question. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I do. The numbers back that up. In 2021, there were about 3,800 abortions provided in Mississippi. But the Mississippi Department of Health says that in all of 2023, there were only four abortion exceptions granted in the entire state. They did not track whether any of those were in cases of rape. We reached out to a number of Mississippi hospitals to ask about protocol and rape exceptions. None wanted to comment specifically. 
And yet the numbers also show across the 14 states that restricted abortion, researchers estimated using historical data, there may have been nearly 65,000 pregnancies caused by rape. The reality is that rapes are underreported. And so when you have a situation where you have an abortion ban that requires a report, it's, women are much less likely to use that pathway to get an abortion when they feel that they need one. We wanted to ask lawmakers in Mississippi about cases like Ashley's. We repeatedly reached out to the office of Governor Tate Reeves and to several state lawmakers, including some who had talked about eliminating the rape exception. We also reached out to Mississippi senators and representatives in Washington. None responded. Regina decided to keep her daughter's pregnancy private, homeschooling Ashley. Then over the summer of 2023, after turning 13, she gave birth to a son. She didn't have to go through this. This is not her time to go through this. He took my child innocent. Police arrested the accused rapist last year. Regina says they used DNA from the baby to prove the link. He remains behind bars charged with felony rape. Was that any sort of relief? relief? Yes. It's justice, baby. Regina says her priority now is making sure her daughter can still be a kid, which means raising her grandson herself. Did, did Ashley start to realize mm -hmm. what had just happened in the situation? I should know that she got a baby. I let her be a child. So I raise them. There she go. When Ashley arrives fresh off the school bus, she jumps in to help. But even just helping is a lot for a kid. Describe like what your typical day is like. You mentioned you go to school and then you come home and changing diapers, making bottles. I don't like changing pamphlets like that. You stay busy between homework and caring School for the work. baby. Mm. Give me a lot though. Feed him, take his bath. A lot you have to juggle. Yes, a lot. Regina and Ashley say they want the world to know the real impacts of laws like these on real families like theirs. And should your daughter, who told you she was raped at 12 years old, have had to give birth? Mm, no, ma'am. She didn't have to give birth to your rapist child. What are your hopes for Ashley? She want to be a nurse. I'm going to still continue raising a baby to help finish her childhood. I want her to go to college. Uh, be that nurse. Uh, get me up out of here. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.